Timelines and graphs can help you capture information to aid in your root cause analysis investigation. Shown here is the timeline from our free cause mapping template. You see it's pretty simple. There are just three columns, date, time, and description. There are some hints that can help you fill out your timeline more effectively. In the date column, the first thing you want to do is format the cells to look like what you want. To do that, click on the column and right click and select Format Cells. The first tab is for number. If you click on date, you'll have some formatting options that are going to show you how the date will look when you enter it in the timeline. If you don't have any preference, I suggest that you use something that's not quite so wide so that your columns won't take up so much room. So we're going to select this here. You'll see now as we type in a date, it's going to look like that. To type in today's date in Excel, use control and semicolon and you'll see it uses the format that we selected. If you want your timeline to go day by day over a series of days, you can actually use a formula. Equals, select the previous date, plus one, and you'll see it adds one day to the previous date. In order to capture a whole slew of dates, you can use control C for copy, scroll down on your timeline as far as you want to go, and then use control V for paste, and you're going to get a nice line on your timeline that shows every day for your timeline. Excel does account for leap years as it goes through. So you see now we have all these dates captured on our timeline. For some of the dates we may have more than one thing that occurs in which case we may want to use time to specify. So let's say that we want to use the current time. We can enter that in Excel using control shift semicolon. Now we can enter whatever happened at 8.39 p.m. on December 1st. So we'll call this event 1. Let's say that something else happened on December 1st. We can add a new row by clicking on the row below, right clicking, and selecting insert. So now we have a new row for December 1st. We can say, say something else happened at 9 o'clock p.m. and this is event 2. Now we have two entries for December 1st. For our descriptions, we do recommend that you put only one thought in each box. If you have more than one thing happen on a given day, you probably want to start using times for that day to specify. If you have a lot of things that are happening all at the same time, you can use the insert. So let's say event 2 and event 3 both happened pretty much at 9 o'clock p.m. We can have a different row and this will specify that both of these events occurred at 9 o'clock p.m. If you have a long timeline, like we are starting to here, you may want to use freeze panes. Click on the cell below the panes that you want frozen, go up to view, and there's a drop down menu under window that says freeze panes. If you click down, see there are three different options. If you select freeze panes, it will freeze the rows above and the columns to the left of your cursor. So in this case, that would be row one and column A. All we really want is the top row frozen, but you can also just freeze the first column. So we're going to select freeze top row. You see what that does is as we scroll down, row one stays in place so that we can see date, time, and description for our timeline. Charts are another way that we can aid in the understanding of our data. So there are many different charts that you can use in Excel. We're going to talk first about column and bar charts. Now column and bar charts, you see here's a column chart and here's a bar chart. They're the same thing but they're rotated 90 degrees. Column and bar charts are useful for either comparing one to three different things over a course of time such as we've done over here or to compare the amounts of several different objects when there's a significant difference between them. And you'll see we've done that over here. Now what we need to do is in our first column we put the values that are going to be our x-axis. In the next column we put the values for the first thing that we want to compare, in this case the projected values. In the second column we can put the second thing that we want to compare, which in this case is actual, and so on. And you can keep adding, but again I recommend sticking with one to three things, otherwise you start getting a little crowded in here. To make our graph, we select this data and go to Insert, Column. You select and you see you can do all these things with columns. You can do 2D, 3D, cylinders, cones, pyramids, all kinds of stuff. 
but we don't need anything fancy. We're just going to use the 2D clustered column. That's the very first one on the top left here. So we click that and you'll see we've made our graph. Now we're going to go through and learn how to make a bar graph. It's going to be very similar. Here, the first data the data in this first column is going to be what runs on our y-axis. So here we have the names of some oil spills and then over here we have the amount released in these oil spills. So what we want is just a simple comparison that's showing us how much oil was spilled in each of these events. To make this graph, we're going to select all this data, go again to insert, this time we're going to do a bar graph and if you click down you'll see that it looks exactly like the column only everything is turned 90 degrees because again these are all the same thing. So we're going to choose that top left one again and this is our 2D clustered bar graph. We select that and it's starting to look like our graph down here but there's a few things that we want to do first. First of all since we only have one series we don't really need this legend here it's not doing a whole lot for us so we can either just press delete or we can go to layout on our chart tools You'll see one of our choices down here is legend. So this is our legend. We can click down and you see right now it's showing the legend at the right. We can have none. Select turn off legend and you'll see that legend goes away. Gain ourselves a little bit of room with that. Now another thing you'll notice is we have a ton of zeros here. Probably don't need all those zeros. So we're going to click on this axis. Right click and select format axis. About halfway down you see display units. If you click down you can put some display units and here everything that we have is in millions. So what we're going to do is select millions here and you see that change that it just made on the graph. Instead of having all those zeros it's just got the integers and then millions as a title. So we're going to close that and now we have this looking pretty similar to my graph. However I decided since we were dealing with um, oil spills we should have gray and not blue. So what we can do for that is go up again to our chart tools and pick design and we've got some different color options here and so I picked this gray to make it look like oil spill. And there you go. We have now made our bar graph. The next kind of graph we're going to talk about is a pie chart. The limitation with pie charts is that all of the data that you put in a pie chart has to add up to a hundred percent. Now that doesn't mean that it needs to be in percentages. With a pie chart data entry is easy. Just have the category and then either per the percent or the whole data value. If you do just put whole data values it's going to automatically convert it to a percent as a portion of the pie chart. So what we do is we just select our values and either our percentages or our numbers and we go to insert pie and again we're just going to choose this nice simple 2D pie chart and then we have our chart you'll see that each one has its own color and then there's a legend that shows what they are. Now a couple things with pie charts. With the pie charts you generally want to keep the smaller pieces of pie together and the larger pieces of pie together otherwise it starts becoming difficult to compare them. So we're going to go back to our data. We're going to select our data. We're going to go up to the data tab here. And we're going to click on sort. Now here we get the sort menu. Right now we're sorting by column C which are these titles. We want to sort by column D and here it's going to go smallest to largest, that's fine, or we could go largest to smallest since it's going to be going in a circle, it doesn't really matter. We say OK and you'll see now it's changed it a little so we have our smallest ones going to our largest and as you can see it's much easier to compare the size of these pies when they're put in order like this. Now one other thing we can do, you can have the pie chart like this, but sometimes matching these tiny little dots to these boxes gets a little bit difficult and you can't tell if this, which blue this matches up with. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to stick the labels right on the pieces of pie. In order to do that, we need to select the chart and now we have these chart tools menu. We're going to click on layout and you'll see there's this text box under the insert menu. This is different from the text box in the other menu, from the other insert menu. This is inserting a text box to the chart, not to the Excel workbook. And it's important to use this text box because this text box is going to stick with the chart, it's going to print out with the chart, so this is a text box for the chart rather than the Excel workbook. So we're going to enter our text box here. So you see this category is still at C or on shore. So we can make this text box here and we can put it right on there. And so you'll see now this pie is labeled and once we've done that for all of the pies we can actually go ahead and get rid of this legend. 
Now we'll look at line charts and area charts. Over here is some data that I got from the New York Times and uh, BP's website regarding the cumulative amount of oil that was released, the cumulative amount of oil that was cleaned, and then the cumulative amount of oil that was remaining for each day during the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. So you see I have the date here, the amount of oil that was released, the amount of oil that was cleaned, and then the amount of oil that was remaining. As you can see, because the spill lasted for several months, I have a lot of data points here. And when I do have this many data points, the two graphs that are going to be most effective are line charts and area charts. This is a line chart here, and you see basically what it does is it just tracks the data based on whatever you're looking at at the x-axis. Here we're looking at the date. Now with the area, it has the exact same shape, but what it is doing is actually tracking the area underneath. First we're going to make a line graph. What we're going to do is select the data, so we have the dates and then these three different columns with data. I'm going to go down and select all the data. Now that we have it, we go to Insert Line. I'm going to pick this 2D line graph, and you'll see here we have our dates, our amounts in millions, and then our series. Now, we want these series to actually be the titles here, so what we can do is right-click on the graph and go to Select Data. You'll see we have Series series 1, Series 2, and Series 3. They're just called Series 1, Series 2, and Series 3. But what we can do is click on each series and edit. So here, our series name is going to be Oil Leaked. That's our first one. Then Series 2, we can edit it, and this is, this is going to be the oil cleaned up. and then series three. Series three is going to be the oil that's remaining. We click OK and you'll see now our graph over here looks just like our graph here. We can do the same thing to make the area graph. We're going to go select the area, so, or I'm sorry, select our data points, go to insert area. Again, we're just going to pick the simple 2D map and then you'll see that we have our series on here. However, I'm going to move up here by this graph. You'll notice that because series 2 is smaller always than series 3, it's showing up behind it and so we can't see it. With an area graph, series 1 is always going to be in the back, then series 2, then series 3. Because our series 2 is smaller than our series 3, we're actually going to have to change the order here. To do that, we're going to right click and go to select data. Now we want series 2 to be on the bottom, so we can use this down arrow, move it down, say OK, and now our series 2 is showing, and this looks just like that map. The last kind of graph we're going to talk about today is a scatter chart. And a scatter chart is good for comparing discrete points. The example that I'm using here is comparing solutions. When you're evaluating solutions for implementation after your root cause analysis, there are two things that you need, need to consider. First is the ease of implementation, and the second is the effectiveness. So what I've actually done here is come up with six solutions, ranked them on the ease of implementation and the effectiveness. We can put them on the graph, and then we can use that to compare them. So what we have here, the lower the number, the easier the implementation of that solution is. And for the effectiveness, the higher the number, the more effective the solution is. We're going to put these on our graph. To make our scatter chart, we're going to select this data here, go to Insert, Scatter, and select just the dots. Um, because our points are discrete, we don't need them to be connected. And here's our scatter chart. Now, you'll see that they've turned easy and effective into our series. So what we're going to do here is right click and go to select data. Now instead of easy and effective being our series, we want these solutions to be our series. So we're going to switch and that gets us part way there. Now solution one, let's edit this. Solution one, our x value is our easy value here. So we're going to replace this with this use the equals key and then click on the box. Now our y value is going to be our effectiveness, so we're going to click on that. That's going to be OK. Now we're going to do the same thing with each of 
these solutions and it, because of the way that the scatter chart is set up since we're using it for multiple data points we are going to have to go through and do this for all the data points and you'll see that's that's how you go through it there the x value is going to be the easy ranking and the y value is going to be the effective ranking and so you can see I've done one through three here you can see one through three are now showing up where they should be on this graph. Solutions 4, 5, and 6 each have two data points on here just because of the way that it's been entered. Once we've gone through and changed all of these, we're going to get something that looks a little bit more like this. Although you see our legend is on the right, and we want it right here with the dots. Now the way to do that is to pick a dot and go to the layout on the chart tools. Underneath data labels, gives you different options for where the data labels are. We're going to go to more data label options and we are going to label with the series name and not the Y value. So you see now it says solution 2. Then you can change the position. I have them above. You say close. Now you are going to have to go through and do that for every data label. Once you've done that, you get something that looks a little bit more like this. You're also going to need to go through and pick access titles. So you can set so right now we have no primary horizontal axis title. We're going to add a title to the horizontal axis and you see then we can go and put ease of implementation in there. Once you've done that you can compare these solutions on the graph. I hope you've enjoyed our presentation about charts today. We do have some more examples and free information on www.thinkreliability.com. I hope you're able to join us again. Thank you.